teenagers are all walking around with semi-disposable supercomputers in their pocket, but sometimes you need the big iron. Our supercomputer is nuclear powered. I'm Professor Mark Hinders, Applied Science Department at William & Mary. I'm here in the NDE lab to talk about structural health monitoring. I'm old enough to remember the days when the people who did experiments were separate from the people who did simulations, who were separate from the people who did theory. These days, um, our students tend to do a bit of all three, depending upon their interests and the needs of their projects. Part of what's going on is in non-destructive evaluation, structural health monitoring, the equipment that's needed to acquire the data is now vanishingly small. An ultrasound apparatus used to be a couple of racks of equipment, and now it's perhaps a, a small little box like this that you connect your transducers to and you run off a tablet or um, a desktop computer. The, uh, and so the equipment um, is relatively easy to use. It's all computerized, and the digital natives have no problem getting those set up, running you know, something like MATLAB or LabVIEW or whatever for data acquisition. The, uh, so the equipment isn't the focus. Um, the focus is what are we going to do with the data that um, we acquire. Uh, we usually these days call that uh, machine learning or maybe machine learning with edge computing, depending on how small the data acquisition is. In structural health monitoring, oftentimes what you want to do is embed the sensors and some of the processing inside the structure so you don't even have to have um, an inspector go and do the inspection. The um, uh, data is acquired automatically as needed. So I have here on the table some T-stiffeners, right? They're T-shaped in the cross section. These are aluminum, they're from Alcoa. And the T-stiffeners um, are the stiffening structural elements inside an aircraft. So the skin of an aircraft is surprisingly thin, and what you have is stiffeners riveted and glued to the inside to provide that structural integrity. The issue is that uh, uh, aluminum corrodes. We don't think of aluminum as rusting. But it does, it will corrode um, if there's moisture. So if you have a T-stiffener, say, under the, in the belly of an aircraft, eventually there's going to be some condensation or maybe a leak or some such thing. The point is that there will be moisture in there eventually, uh, and that can um, settle in the bottom of the aircraft and cause corrosion. And so one way to monitor for this is to install sensors. And the sensors can be quite small. Uh, but the issue is that um, the signal wires that you need to run from one sensor to another, um, the length of those can be quite significant, and, uh, and then the weight of those. And so what you want to do is strictly minimize the number of sensors that you're going to install in order to monitor corrosion. So um, what you care about structurally is the thickness reduction in the metal from the corrosion. And so if we put a transducer here, and a transducer at the other end of the structural element. These are about a meter long, but it could be much longer than that. And um, these ultrasound transducers um, propagate mechanical vibrations in um, the flange, for example, um, of the stiffener. And the lamb waves um, have the important property that how fast they go depends on, on um, the thickness of the metal. And so these guided waves can be useful to monitor things like thickness loss due to corrosion um, by monitoring changes in the arrival times of the signals um, that propagate from one place to another. The challenge, of course, is how far apart can you put those sensors? You want to get good sensitivity to corrosion, so you choose a lamb wave mode that has a fair amount of dispersion to it. And what that means is that as the wave packets propagate, they're going to distort quite badly. So the challenge is uh, still interpreting the arrival times of those badly distorted lamb wave modes in order to be able to tell um, uh, the, the extent of material loss due to, for example, corrosion. So it's delightfully complicated. And so um, the, uh, we got a bunch of T-stiffeners, and we began some experiments in the laboratory to uh, um, see uh, how we could develop the algorithms to automatically track corrosion. And so a simple test to do was to uh, um, measure the propagation down the, the length of a T-stiffener and then mill off a bit of thickness, measure it again, mill off a bit more, measure it again, mill it off, measure it a bit more. And it doesn't show up especially well here, but there's a region where we have sequentially milled um, off bits of the T-stiffener. And then, uh, this isn't quite as pretty, 
Um, this one's especially ugly. And what we've done there is uh, um, controlled um, application of, of chemicals to introduce corrosion. There's an ASTM standard for this. And so we did the um, uh, apply the stuff that's going to cause the corrosion. It's accelerated corrosion, but it still takes kind of a long time. Um, and then let that sit for a while, wash it off, um, do uh, a measurement, repeat it. And this went on for some number of weeks. So we get sequential measurements of the uh, um, progression of corrosion and see what that did to the LAM wave signals propagating down the length of the T stiffener. Okay. Signals were complicated, uh, so we used high performance computing in order to help interpret what was going on. And the particular kind of simulation method that we favored for this is a finite difference kind of method rather than a finite uh, element sort of method. The finite difference methods have the advantage that you take the differential equations and the boundary conditions describing the propagation of the elastic waves, and you discretize those um, and in both time and three-dimensional space. They also have the advantage that you can do arbitrary geometries. These are fairly simple geometries. And uh, the um, computing power that we have available allows us to simulate exactly the measurement that we're doing in high enough resolution that we can um, uh, use the results to help figure out what's happening in the waves. Okay. So let me show you um, a couple of clips of movies. Um, the first one is a fairly um, simple one, but it's kind of interesting. The first time we showed this publicly, the audience went, woo, right? Because it's, uh, um, it's a complicated shape, and what you're going to see is the um, start of the signal at the back end, and then the waves are going to come toward you. And the key thing is that in this false color representation, you can see that the uh, wave field, the mechanical vibrations, are filling the entire structure. Now, this next one is just a, um, a looks like just a, a block of stuff, but it's two layers, two different metals. Uh, and again, um, we start the signal propagating, and that signal fills up the entire structure. Um, but also, uh, the, the you, if you look closely, maybe you can see where the uh, um, there's the interface between the two different materials, and uh, you get some reflections there. And now this next one um, is the same, but there's a delamination, a place where the, the, the two uh, parts of material are not in good contact. And there, what you might be able to see, both the reflection and transmission through the interface, but you can also see a little bit of a guided wave that's propagating along that interface. Okay, so these kind of simulations are helpful um, to illustrate the point that you put a transducer at one location and you excite the waves that can fill the entire structure and then at some place else you can pick up that signal and uh, help to figure out what's going on. So we also simulated the T-stiffeners. So this one here, where we've got some thinning, I'm going to show you um, a simulation of that. Uh, and because these are time domain simulations, the, uh, you can um, uh, string them together as a movie. And but that will show uh, the uh, propagation of the waves. And you can see the guided waves going down the flange, also filling the rest of the structure. Um, but um, you can see uh, maybe a little speeding up um, uh, when it gets to the thin region, some reflection there, and so on. So we did a bunch of simulations like that, um, and we did the accelerated corrosion tests. And this one here that's kind of a mess, the, uh, um, this one was particularly interesting. One of the things that we, we did once we had finished the accelerated corrosion test and collected all that data um, was we um, put it in the immersion tank, and from the back side, we did a C scan of it. And that C scan allowed us to map out the contour of the um, sound metal underneath the corrosion, and then we, re we read that um, surface um, of the complete thing, including the, the corrosion surface, into our simulation, and we simulated exactly the uh, um, waves propagating in that structure. And so that movie is cool, um, and also it's not just cool, um, these um, simulations allowed us to figure out um, a quirky thing that was happening in our um, analysis methods where we're trying to pick off the arrival times accurately in time to tell changes in arrival time due to the structural flaws. And we had always been able to, in simpler things like plates and whatnot, to pick off um, that first arriving mode um, rather accurately. 
And what we were finding is that for these T-stiffeners, we weren't able to pick off that first arriving mode, but we were able to pick off um, one of the later arriving modes. And looking at the simulation results in detail, we found out, ah, um, just dumb luck on our case, the particular size of the, of the, um, the web um, relative to the frequencies that we were using meant that where we were trying to pick off that arrival time, um, the signal bouncing around um, inside this three-dimensional structure was sort of canceling itself out for that first arriving mode, and that's why our algorithms were, were automatically tracking the second arriving mode, and that was cool. Another funny thing um, about these simulations, the movies are pretty, of course, but the, the amount of data in those simulations is enormous. And uh, we're using, a, as I said, a Beowulf-like cluster, um, massively parallel simulation. The, the finite integration technique is, is well suited to that. Um, and in those days, the visualization laboratory happened to be um, in one building on campus in, in the basement of the library, I think. Um, and the supercomputer um, was across campus uh, in another one. And Jill Bingham, the graduate student who was doing this, she was in the basement of the library jamming enormous amounts of data across the network in order to make these beautiful color images and movies of, of, of her simulations. And, um, there was one time where she actually crashed the network in the library because she was trying to jam um, so much data through it um, to do her simulations. We thought that was funny. Um, the undergraduate students upstairs pretending to study but really checking out um, their uh, uh, Facebook or their Instagram didn't think that was so funny. These days, um, we've got that supercomputer just around the corner in the Integrated Science Center adjacent to our laboratory, so the students here um, don't have to worry about jamming enormous amounts of data across campus through the network. Running water, electricity, high performance computing. If you make us pick only two, we will bring in bottled water and go pee next door, which we did in my lab for a whole year during an inconvenient renovation. I'm Professor Mark Hinders, Applied Science Department at William & Mary, as.wm.edu.